Well, good evening. In closing, I'd like to just... <laughs> that was great. It was fantastic. And I do think you should have our brother here as an evangelist. I listened to you. I listened to you. It was great. It was fantastic. So the last couple of times we met, we looked at Mark. We looked at Luke. We saw how both of them showed us the fullness of who, who Jesus is, particularly Jesus as the one who does what we believe is impossible. We're going to look at Mark chapter 5 today. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Mark chapter 5. I like the gospel of Mark for a lot of reasons. I like all the gospels for different reasons at different times and different seasons of my life. But I really like the gospel of Mark, particularly because Mark reminds us over and over again and again that Jesus is on the move. And whenever Jesus is on the move, whenever he's going from place to place with all the absolute authority that he has over death and disease, over sin, over guilt and shame, whenever he's on the move, something fantastic, something great, something miraculous is going to happen that will blow your mind. You'll see something that seems impossible be made possible through the power, person, and presence of Jesus Christ. The first day, we saw how 15, 20,000 people were hungry and needed to be fed. It looked like an impossible task, yet Jesus comes in and shows them that it's possible by creating food from five fish, or for two fish and five loaves of bread. And then this morning, we talked about how it's impossible to catch fish in the Sea of Galilee, which is the Lake of Gennesaret, during the day out in deep water. When the sun is high and bright, but Jesus specifically had them go out into the waters of the impossible to show the disciples, particularly Peter, that with him all things are possible. Mark will show us again and again how Jesus is on the move. And when you see Jesus, according to Mark, there's a sense of urgency that Mark is trying to communicate, I believe, to the reader here about who Jesus is. Jesus is urgent, but not in a hurry. There's a difference. He's urgent, but not in a hurry. I think there's a story about my uncle, Uncle Howard. And his example in this story is just perfect for drawing this distinction between being in a hurry and being urgent. The story goes that when Howard was growing up, and Howard is the oldest and only brother of my dad, and how he was always five minutes late from where he needed to be or where he thought he needed to be. In this particular day, growing up on the farm, he took his 62 Chevy, blue Chevy truck, and he pulled it up really quickly, really fast, over to the farm gas pump. They had their own gas pump on the farm. He got out of the car, my dad said, and my dad's watching all this unfold. He got out of the car, he grabbed, he grabbed the, the pump, and he went to fill up his car. He filled it up, and then he went and put the pump back but he forgot that the hose uh, didn't go all the way back, so it was wrapped around the, the, bump, or the bumper part. I guess I've never seen trucks like this. This is before my time. <laughs> so, but I guess it gets caught up in, in the bumper somehow, and so it got caught up, and he hopped in the car, and he pulled away, and he pulled over the entire gas pump. Meanwhile, my grandfather is watching behind my dad, watching all this. And Grandpa was a very strong, very strong man, very strong farmer until Parkinson's took him and he went to see Jesus. But he was very strong, very farm, very, very strong on the farm, very patient, very caring, very calm. So he simply walked over, looked at Howard, shook his head, went over and literally picked up the gas pump that had bent over, bending it back up. Man was strong. Went over to my uncle, looked at him, shook his head, and said, always in a hurry. Always in a hurry. There's a distinction between being in a hurry and being urgent. Jesus is never, ever in a hurry. When you're in a hurry, you, you, you make mistakes. When you rush things, you overlook things. You settle for things that aren't as excellent. Jesus was never in a hurry, but he was urgent. And one of the reasons I know this is the case isn't just from the stories that we read in the Gospel of Mark, but particularly because Mark chooses. He chooses through the guidance of the Holy Spirit to focus on one particular word almost in every chapter of Mark, and that is the word immediately. In Greek, it's euthus. It's immediately. 
It's right now. It's instantaneous. It's spontaneous. It's sudden. It's immediate. Mark uses it 41 times in his gospel. Several in the chapter that the passage that we're going to read today. As a parent, I pr appreciate the word immediately because when I ask my kids to do the dishes, I want it done immediately. When I ask them to bring their clothes down and clean their room, I want them to do it right now. When my son hasn't showered in two days at age 13, which is gross, and I tell him to go shower, I want him to do it immediately, actually about two days ago. Immediately. Mark uses this time and time again to show us the urgency of Jesus and his mission, that he's, that he's moving purposely and powerfully wherever he goes. He's on the move to make a difference. And Mark shows us that this Jesus who moves immediately when he comes into contact with people and there's an encounter, then there's an immediate change there, an immediate transformation. There is a sudden impact upon the lives of those who want to receive what Jesus has to offer. So I like Mark for a lot of reasons because it shows who Jesus is, not just in the Gospels, but who Jesus is today, who is a man, a savior, fully God, fully human, who is on the move. Mark chapter 5, we see Jesus doing... The miraculous, once again, we see him doing what people would think to be impossible. We see Mark chapter 5, and we're going to start at verse uh, 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, that is the Sea of Gennesaret, a large uh, lake of Gennesaret, the Sea of Galilee, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Large crowds followed Jesus wherever he goes. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd, there's that large crowd again, followed and pressed around him. And a woman who was there, was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She has suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and has spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When, Jesus heard, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering at once, or in Greek, immediately, Euthus, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around, and the crowd asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you, you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? This child is not dead, but asleep. But then they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father, mother, and disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up immediately. The girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. She gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give, give her something to eat. Let's pray. God, we thank you for yet another day another gift of life that you've given each and every one of us. Your word says that every good and perfect gift comes from above. It comes from you, and we have so much in this moment to be grateful for. We do thank you for the gift of life and love and laughter, the gift of faith and family and friendship and freedom. We thank you for the gift of your son who gave us 
the gift of his example for how to live according to the will and way of God, and then who gave his life for us so that we can be given the gift of salvation and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and all of this given to us, yet we're still so grateful for the gift of your word that breathes life into our beings because it's so powerful. It's your very breath into us. We ask right now that this little portion of scripture that we read today, that you use it to have an immediate impact upon our lives so we can live for your kingdom and your glory. We pray all this in your son's name, the strong name of Jesus, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And everyone said, amen. So Mark is showing us in this passage you read, again, that Jesus is on the move. And when Jesus is on the move, great things are going to happen. It's interesting that we have two stories that are seemingly different and yet kind of go together. Mark is showing us here a lot of different things, I think, initially. The first thing he's thinking is that, that there is a similarity in this discussion. Mark's not talking about uh, two different stories, really. He's talking about one story as a whole. What we have here is Mark's beginning the first story, the story about Jairus. He's telling the story about Jairus, and everything's going great. Then it's suddenly interrupted by a second story. Mark addresses that second story, wraps it up, and then comes back to the first story, and then he finishes up. So you have story number one here and here, and story number two in the middle. Now, there's a big, deep theological word for what he's doing here. If you're taking notes, you can write this down. You ready for it? I'll even help you spell it. It's called sandwiching. <laughs> Happens nine times. In the Gospel of Mark alone, sandwiching. And he's sandwiching this. He's telling this story within a story, not because he's chasing a rabbit down a trail, not because he's working on his ADD, not because he's having the squirrel moment. He's doing it specifically. He's telling you that be prepared that when Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, is moving, and he's moving all the time, when he goes from point A to point B, expect to be surprised by joy. Be on alert because you never know what's going to happen when you're following Jesus on the move. So today we're, we're going to, in the next few moments, we're going to look at what Mark is communicating, communicating to us. We're going to look at these two stories in one, but we're going to actually begin with the second story first because I think that the second story, which is the first miracle, is the thing that we can explore to use as the key to unlock the entire passage. Now, Jesus is traveling a lot in the Gospel of Mark. In all the Gospels, he's traveling a lot. We're told that wherever he goes, several times, which is a passage, that a large crowd is following him. So he's very, very popular. People are drawn to him. He is, he's charismatic. He's magnetic. He's enthusiastic. He's, he's the giver of life. That makes sense. He even said he is the way, the truth, and the life. So he gives life wherever he goes, and people are drawn to that. I don't know if you've ever had someone that you know who walks in the room and sort of that has that je ne sais quoi, something special, and that you know that that person just lights up the room, and they're, they're sort of the light of the party, and people just kind of gravitate towards their presence. I don't know if anyone that I know who would, would ever want to be called the death of the party, because you would never gravitate towards someone who's got some lackluster personality who's always down like some Eeyore character. No, we gravitate naturally towards life, and thousands and thousands of people are gravitating towards Jesus, not because he just communicates love and joy and pa uh, passion for, for the people and compassion, but because he actually gives life wherever he goes, and people want what he has to give. And so he's on the move here, and he's walking from one place to another like he's always doing. In the beginning of the passage, we see that he traveled again by boat. In the Gospel of Mark, we see him taking many boat trips. Again, I think we talked about this last night, as a way for respite to get away with the disciples, to give them some alone time and to get away from the masses. But he's also walking a lot by foot everywhere he goes. I heard a story just uh, a couple, maybe a couple months ago about a father and his teenage son who were talking about the teenage son becoming 16 and getting his license and doing driving. And a 16-year-old son came up to the father and said, Dad, I'm going to be 16 in a little bit. I'm going to be a man. Uh, and so I think I should get my license and, and have a truck. 
And the, and, the, and the father said, oh, you're going to be a man, huh? Okay, all right. Let's, well, we'll work on that. And the, and the son was pretty adamant. He's like, Dad, I really want to get my license on my birthday, and I want a truck. What can I do to make this happen? And the father thought about it for a moment and said, you know what? We can make that happen. You just need to do three things by the time you're 16, and we'll make sure that you get your license, and we'll find you a little truck. The, f the first thing you need to do, though, is get your grades up. These C's and D's that you're getting, eh, not cutting it. We need A and B's. A's and B's. The second thing you need to do is you need to get a job. I'm not paying for your gas, and I don't have a gas pump on my farm. So what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to get a job to buy gas. And the third thing you're going to do is, man, you're going to need to cut your hair. It's a mess. So time goes on. The son is about to turn 16. It's the day before his 16th birthday, and he, he's feeling good about the kind of deal he and his dad made. And so he comes up to his dad the night before he's turned 16 and said, Dad, I've got good news. And the dad said, yes, son, what's that? He's like, I'm getting my license tomorrow. We're going to need to give you a truck. And the father said, okay, let me see what you got. First, the son was so excited to hand his dad a report card and say, here it is, A's and B's. The son was like, good, I'm proud of you. And the father was good, I'm proud of you. The son then said, here's my first paycheck. I got a job at the local HEB. So I'm ready to go. The father said, good. The son said, okay, I'm ready for that car tomorrow, ready for the license. And the father said, oh, no, you're forgetting one more thing. The son said, what's that? He said, you've got to cut your hair. You've got to cut your hair. And the son said, come on, Dad, why do I have to cut my hair? I can be cool riding in a truck with the windows down, my hair flopping in the breeze. I don't want to cut my hair. Besides, Jesus had long hair. And the father said, yeah, but Jesus walked everywhere he went. <laughs> I had to tell that. You give a preacher a whole hour, we got to find a little bit more material. <laughs> and that fits so perfectly because Jesus is constantly walking. I, just, I think it's so important to, to just think about how it's a different time, different age. I mean, some of us are walking a lot on campus, right, in the heat, back and forth, back and forth. This is a man who walked hundreds and thousands of miles, who had in his own words, no place to lay his head, really, but not just when he was born, no place to lay his sweet head, but even in, in, in his ministry. He had, he, he had Capernaum as like a camp out, but he really had no place to just call home. But he wasn't about staying in one place. The man was on a mission. The man was on the move. The man was urgent. And this particular day, he's urgently walking to Jairus' house. But while he's on his way, something amazing happens. See, he's the main character in every passage of Scripture he's in, right? Of Duh. That's another deep theological word. Duh. He, he's, the, he's the main character in every story. But in the second story, in the middle of the sandwich, there's another main character who sometimes goes unnoticed. And it's the woman who's hemorrhaging. We're told that this woman has a blood disease, a bleeding disease, and she's had it for 12 years. 12 years. She's been bleeding for 12 years. And because she has this bleeding disease, because she's bleeding for 12 years, she's considered to be un unclean, ceremonial unclean, which means that she can't ever go to the temple. And if you can't go to the temple in this context, in this context, before Jesus gave his life as a sacrificial lamb of God, if you can't go to the temple, then you can't sacrifice doves if you can't afford a lamb or, or a goat. You can't make sacrifices, which means that you can't somehow at least temporarily have your sins atoned. In addition to that, you can't really go anywhere. Uh, so she's considered not just banned from the temple, she's banned from community. She's an outcast. She's been disregarded and discarded by society. She is not allowed to be in the presence of anyone because she is unclean. Her body is literally being destroyed by this disease, and her, her hope is being depleted every year that she has to do life with this disease. And so she, she's She's struggling. Big time. She is tossed out. She's tried all the latest and greatest concoctions. She spent all the money she had on that. She's been to the best doctors in town. She's tried her best to deal with the situation, but up until this point, 
Nothing has worked. She may have even visited Tiberias a time or two because she heard there were hot springs there that somehow, some way, had some magical quality to them. Or maybe she went to the pool of Bethsaida because she heard that when the water there bubbles up and you get in there and take a dip, maybe you'll find healing. So she's tried everything. She's exhausted all of her resources except one. Here comes Jesus, the Son of God, is almost within her reach. Now, it's interesting how lots of things get lost in translation from the Greek. And one of the things that gets lost in this passage is a big deal to me. It might not be a big deal to, to some people, but she hears that Jesus is coming into town, so she takes a step of faith and she goes to try to come in contact with him some way, somehow. But in the Greek, in this story, actually we're told that she hears that the Jesus is coming into town. The Jesus. Now, there are many Jesuses in this time. There are many people who had the name Jesus. Jesus in the Hebrew is Yeshua. Yeshua literally means Yahweh saves. So Jesus, the name means the God who saves. But she, it's not just any Jesus coming into town. It's the Jesus, which means she hears that the God who saves is coming into town. And now she's willing to do whatever she has to do to find a way to get to him. But there's a problem. She can't just show up to town. She's not invited. She's an outcast. I mean, you, many of us have had COVID, right? Let's just be honest. Raise your hand if you've had COVID. All right, raise your hand if you were sick, but you didn't test and you didn't know if you had COVID, but you think you have COVID. You're self-diagnosed. Come on. There's some of you. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> That's, he's a smart one. He's like under the radar. We know what quarantine is like then, right? I don't even know if I ever used the word quarantine before COVID. We know what quarantine is like. When you get COVID or you have the effects of COVID, what do you do? You isolate yourself. You practice your, your Uber Eats skills or you order. I didn't even know how to, I didn't know it was possible to order groceries online, but I did that. It was amazing. It just, it's like Jesus showed up. Boom, food. <laughs> she quarantined for 12 years. So you think anything is going to stop her when she hears that the God who saves is coming into town? Wouldn't, wouldn't stop any one of us. She's doing her, her best to make this happen. But there's a problem because she can't be seen. But then she begins thinking to herself, but, but what if I kind of go under the radar? What if I kind of just put my cloak over my head and, and just kind of blend in? It's a large crowd. There are a lot, a lot of people, shoulder to shoulder. I could just kind of slide in, unassumed, unannounced. But then what? What am I supposed to do then? I can't yell out, Jesus, God who saves. I can't do that. And people will know us. They'll see me, and then they'll freak out. And I might be pushed to the side or the periphery or at best or, or at worst stoned. So she's just thinking to herself, if, but somehow, some way, I've just got to get to Jesus. So she begins taking those steps of faith. But I can imagine as she's taking those steps of faith, looking around, seeing who's noticing her or not noticing her, that she begins doubting whether she can make this happen. Maybe she's thinking, I can't yell out to Jesus and that's going to be a problem. And besides, even if I could, why would he stop from me? Who am I? I'm a nobody. I've been sick and praying for a long time, and, he, and the God who saves hasn't heard me yet. And, and, and besides, he's on his way right now to see more important people, to do more important things. That rich man, Jairus, I heard his daughter sick. Certainly he's got to go there. He's not going to stop from me. But maybe if I just, maybe if I just, kind of brush up against him maybe if i even just kind of bump him then that's all it would take but I, I can't touch his hand that'd be too obvious and appropriate i can't touch his head that that wouldn't work so maybe just even a thread a piece of his cloak maybe that would work so she begins convincing herself that that's all it's going to take sliding in incognito weaving her way in and out of the crowd. She's finding it more and more difficult because the crowd, just like life, begins pushing her back 
or to the periphery, but she's convinced that this is her chance. The God who saves is coming her way. So she pushes her way through and all of a sudden just glances at Jesus. And all of a sudden, pop! Something's happened. I bought my first house when I was probably 24 years old. It was the second version of the money pit, I think. <laughs> we gutted a lot of it. We did ourselves. I didn't really know what I was doing. I still kind of don't know what I was doing, but you, you, you think you can figure it out. You think, oh, well, maybe I could just watch a YouTube channel nowadays and, and just copy what they're doing. I thought I could do this with a chainsaw one time, making carvings out of wood. I'll just watch, the, watch them do it and, and uh, see if I could do it just like that. I mean, it doesn't work. So, there, so before YouTube really was popular, I went to, uh, you've done that, huh? <laughs> Again, not surprised. <laughs> so, so this, I, I didn't, we didn't have YouTube, so I just went to Home Depot and I said, listen, I, I'm, we gutted our kitchen and, and that was easy because tearing down is always easier than building up. <laughs> tearing down is always easier than building up. That's a whole nother sermon. And so we gutted it, and we had them bring appliances, and I was able to kind of put those in, and we had somebody come in and do the granite. That was definitely above my pay grade. But I thought, I convinced myself, I could do the backsplash. I could do that. I'll go take a class at Home Depot. I'll get a little, little tile saw and put some water in it because you got to do that. I, that was the first. I didn't know you had to put water in the saw until I was trying to cut tile. And so I put this together. I always, even to this day, I underestimate how much material I need. So I'm cutting it close towards the end of this project. We were doing it all day. My brother was doing the measuring and, and the cutting, and then I was putting it on strategically on the angles and stuff like that. One last piece was left, the most difficult piece. We had to put a hole in the middle of the tile so it would go nicely over the outlet. This had to be done right because the night was late, the stores were closed, and the boxes were empty. So I say, I got it, I got it. Put a little stuff on the, what is it, mortar? Stuff on the grout on the back? You put it on the back? Okay. Super glue on the back, <laughs> and I went to put it in, and all of a sudden, pop! I forgot to turn off the power. A jolt like I've never, ever experienced in my life knocked me back. That last tile that we were using, the final tile, shattered on the new granite countertop. We had to wait a day, and I had suddenly had a, some weird nerve pinch in my back for about a week. This lady, is all I can understand, this lady comes up, just brushes against Jesus, all of a sudden, pam, pop, zap, whatever sound it make, all of a sudden, the supernatural, divine life of the God who saves comes down upon him, her courses through her veins, in her arteries, and what? Instantly. Immediately, she's healed. Immediately. Jesus, did you catch this? Jesus says, what was that? <laughs> this is Jesus, right? So he's fully God, and he's fully human. In his humanity, it's hard to comprehend, but in his humanity, there are moments when he seems to give off that he doesn't know what's going on. So I don't know if this particular question he's asking because he's just trying to see what the response would be from the lady that, who just encountered his supernatural power, or if he actually doesn't know. But this is Jesus, so I'm going to assume that he, he understands the whole situation. So he says, what was that? And then who's the brilliant disciple who steps up and says, well, <laughs> it's a big crowd, Jesus. There are a lot of people around here. As if, like, he needed to understand that there's a large crowd, and it could have been a lot of people who bumped up into him. These disciples sometimes, woof. They remind me of my children. They remind me of me sometimes. So Jesus says, what was that? They said, some, you know, some, there are a lot of people here. And he looks around, and he says, somebody touched my clothes. Finally, the lady who experienced this divine healing, who now is no longer bleeding, who's been regenerated, renewed, and revived, 
out of maybe fear, because that's normal response. We saw that from Peter when he experienced the power of God this morning. He was terrified. She was too. She was terrified at the awesome power that she just experienced from the God who saves. In fear and trembling, she falls down at his feet. And Jesus, in only a way Jesus could do, very compassionately, comes over to her. And what's he say? Are you crazy? Somebody could have got hurt. No, he didn't say that. That's not in the Bible. Come on. He didn't say that at all. He didn't say, lady, who do you think you are? Come on, get in line. There's a lot of people here in the crowd that want healing. Peter, aren't you giving out numbers? She could, he could have, she could have, you know, he could have said that, I, I, I guess. He could have said, L listen, you're, you're just going to have to you ask next time. I would have been happy to heal you. People ask. Ask the guy who had just healed leprosy. He asked. Why can't you just be like everybody else? Wait, no, he, he didn't say that at all, did he? Very lovingly, he just said two profound things. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. So who did the healing? Duh. <laughs> Jesus did the healing, of course. And yet Jesus told her that she was instrumental in her healing. Your faith. I mean, these are the words of Jesus. If you want to get sophisticated about it, they're in red in most of your Bibles. But even if you don't have Bibles that have red and black letters, there's a phrase called ipsissima verba Jesu, which means the exact words of Jesus. And I believe Jesus exactly looked at her and said, daughter, your faith has healed you. And then he said, go in peace. And actually, he didn't say go in peace. What's your Bible say? Go in peace? No. Make your plane. Bzz. Go into peace. It was in the Greek. Not go in peace. Go into peace. I had to think about that one for a while. We often say go in peace, meaning after church, have a nice day. Go out and enjoy the sunshine. Or in our case, we need some rain. Enjoy the rain. Be kind, be caring, be compassionate, be peaceful, act peacefully. But really, he didn't say do those things. He said go into peace, which means you, my daughter, has, have been healed because of your faith, and now you are completely whole, completely made new, completely revived and regenerated. You are now healed. Step in, fall in, collapse into the knowledge of the power of my peace is different than just passing the peace, saying hi, and actually residing in the miraculous work of the one who did what seemed to be impossible. And so that's miracle number one, story number two, middle of the sandwich. And what's the key here? Faith. Jesus heals people all over the Gospels, and yet there are specific cases when he says to people that their faith made a difference. Your faith healed you. Now we're in the first story. Jairus, whoo, did he see a lot? Wow. Jairus, in the beginning of our passage, he, he takes steps of faith too. Only unlike this woman, his, his faith is loud. It is it is. Dramatic, it's, it's, it's over the top. He hears that the God who saves, the Jesus, is coming into town, and he runs to meet him. He sees him, and then he falls down face first in the ground and tells Jesus, if you can come to my daughter who's sick and just touch her, I know she will live. Now, that's faith. And, and while, he's, while he's doing this, he, he's believing that Jesus has the power to make a difference and do the, the miraculous. And Jesus says, okay, let's go. And so they walk, and they go. And Jesus is on the move. And now he's going from point A, and he's going from point B, but there's point A too in the middle. And can you imagine the Jairus' experience and how much his faith is bolstered? After, in the, on the way, in route to his daughter, he sees the, a miracle happen. He sees this woman who probably is known around town, 
Probably been, you know, you know how the gossip train works. People have been talking about her for a long time. He knows about, Jairus knows about this lady, and now he knows, actually sees that she's healed. So he's, he's feeling great. He's like, oh, I already believe that Jesus can heal my daughter. Now I, I, I really believe that, that it was going to get done. Imagine how excited he is. So, so he, at this, at this point, is believing that, that everything's going to be okay. And if you think about Jairus for a moment, just do a little character sketch on him. Jairus has a lot to lose in this story, unlike the woman. Because Jairus was, was pretty well known. Jairus was a leader in, in the synagogues, which means he had, he had friends in high places. He was part of the social elite. He had friends like the Pharisees, though, who, who weren't exactly big Jesus fans. And so they're not going to appreciate his newfound faith or his faith in, in Jesus. They're not going to do, they're not going to feel very good about him going and recognizing that this is a miracle worker, this is a healer. But Jairus doesn't care at any point of the story what his friends think. He doesn't care what the, the Pharisees say. He doesn't listen to their opinion. He would rather lose his friends and lose his daughter. So in the middle of this walk, when he experiences the miraculous with this woman who's been bleeding for 12 years, he's at an all-time high, and all of a sudden it's interrupted. It says in the, in the text, Jesus was still talking. We talked about yesterday about things that we shouldn't do or say to Jesus. I mean, we, we talked about, remember last night, we shouldn't tell Jesus what to do, right? You should never tell Jesus what to do. You should ask. I would say a second close second to that is don't interrupt him maybe maybe that would work he's literally talking to the woman saying your faith has healed you step into peace and while he's mid-sentence these guys come over and i'm guessing jairus is right next to him and they break up the conversation as jairus is looking at jesus and just in in awe and wonder at what just happened they say your daughter's dead don't bother the teacher anymore <laughs> i can imagine some of the crowd saying you know what that's it show's over let's go home and end the story it's it's over we believed enough for jesus in his power to to heal this woman because we saw it and we also believed somehow some way that he could have, he could have healed the daughter who was sick but now that she's dead it, it's over let's just go home classic jesus ignores them I love, I love watching Jesus in the Gospels ignore the ridiculous. He never, ever seems to respond to the ridiculous. It's something that I'm so, I try so hard to do in my life on Facebook or out there. I, I, and I hear ridiculous things being said. I try really hard not to respond to, re, to the ridiculous. Even on the cross, as one of the thieves was mocking Jesus, did he respond to the mocking thief? No. He did not respond to the ridiculous. He ignored the comments about, you know what, it's, it's all over, don't bother the teacher anymore. He looked at Jairus and he said the same two words up front that he said to Peter this morning. He said, don't be afraid. I guess that's three. Don't be afraid, then just believe. At this point, you can see Jesus maybe not losing his patience, but it's definitely not the same. He's, at this point, he's sort of done with the large crowds who are just falling to get the, the miraculous handouts. Because now he's just going to take Peter and James and John, and he's going to take Jairus and, and his wife to the house. And when they get there, the home that was once full of whispers of hope because the miracle working was, was coming, because the miracle worker was on his way, because the Jesus was en route, all of a sudden was replaced with weeping and wailing. And actually in this context, and we talked about this, and actually in this context, there are people professionally paid to mourn, to weep. It's their job to make sure that if you suffered loss, it's, it's their job to make sure that you endure, that you go the appropriate time period of mourning. There are a lot of, there are a lot of people in our context that are paid, seemingly paid to weep or paid to be negative or paid to say no. You can just find any complaint committee at any church, and you'll see that there are professional people who are paid in their mind to stop people from believing in the miraculous. 
to prevent people from accepting the reality that with God all things are possible. And all of a sudden, though, these professional weepers and wailers shift gears. Because, you know, they're just getting paid. They're not really sad. It's just a show. It's just because, you know, they're professionals. They've got to act the part. So all of a sudden, they start laughing. Why can they make that switch? Because they have no skin in the game. They're just there to, to help the family mourn. They're not really compassionate. And they start laughing because Jesus says, no, no, no. She's not dead. She's asleep. Two words in Greek for sleep. The first is actually sleep. Natural sleep. It's the kind of sleep that sometimes I see on Sunday mornings during my sermon. <laughs> you just hope that they're praying, that they're connecting with God, that they're deep in thought or something. That's natural sleep. The second time of sleep is actually death. We see it referred to in the Old Testament context. We see it referred to here. We see it referred to in our day and age. This, this afternoon, uh, I took a little walk down here. I, I hope I was, supposed to, I was able to go that way. I went to the cemetery. You said there was like a secret passageway. It felt like going into Narnia for a moment there, stepping through the wardrobe. I got into the cemetery, and I just began walking around. And it sounds cliche, but I thought, you know, what would Jesus do? Well, he'd raise, the, he'd raise everybody like, boom, boom, no. So uh, I tried it. didn't work. <laughs> um, I have faith, but not quite that much, I guess. But I, I, I went over, and this is so fitting. And you know how God sends you those, those little messages, those little hints just to remind you that, uh, well, first of all, remind you that um, you're not in charge ever. And, and then also just to give you little glimpses of faith. It's sort of like what Jairus experienced on the way, although that's a big glimpse of faith. And so I came across a tombstone. I was looking for the oldest, just in this section. And I found what I thought was oldest. It was from, the person was born like 1880-something and, and died in the 50s. And, and it was a pastor. So then, I, for obvious reasons, duh, I, it, it caught my attention. And for a moment there, I, met, I, I thought, well, what would my tombstone look like? Would, would, I, would it say Reverend? Would it say Jason? What would it say? I'm going to leave that up to my kids. I don't know. But it said Reverend Richard, and then below it, I, you can't make this up. I have a picture to prove it. It says, asleep in Jesus. Now, for a moment there, theologically, I think I have time just to talk about this. For, for a moment, theologically, I thought to myself, well, it can be confusing to people. And Brother Tom could probably do a better job explaining this than I can. I believe that... In our context today, especially after the cross, I can get into that later, that when we die, we fall asleep. Our bodies go into the ground. From ashes we came to ashes we shall return. But our souls are immediately transported or whatever into heaven, and we're in the arms of Jesus. Until the day Jesus returns with all the souls with them, and then our souls are reunited with our bodies, and then in the words of Paul, we are raised incorruptible. So I believe from a physical sense that my brother over there, Reverend Richard, my brother and colleague, his body is asleep, but he's more alive than ever with Jesus. But the second meaning for the word sleep is actually death. And Jesus used that word, asleep, to acknowledge the fact that in your minds, in your realm of the impossible, she is dead. But in my world, and because of my power, she's sleeping. And I have the power to wake her up. And so with Peter, James, and John, three very credible witnesses, and Jairus, another credible witness, who likely will tell his little Pharisee friends what he's going to see, and they won't like it. And then Jairus' wife, Jesus walks over to the girl. I imagine that he kneels down by her bedside or the mat, takes her by the hand, it says, Talvacum. And what word? Immediately, the same divine power that spoke creation into existence out of nothing, along with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit in Christ, comes upon this little girl. The same divine power, the supernatural life, that 
that the woman experienced after 12 years of bleeding that gave her complete healing and wholeness and absolute full, undescribable peace within comes upon this little girl and in a moment she's alive and standing there. And then classic Jesus. Do you catch what he says at the end after he raises her from the dead? Give her something to eat. I mean, I've never died before. But if I did die and I came back to life, I'd be hungry too. <laughs> I'd be hungry. It just makes it so real. Mark is reminding us that this, this Jesus is, is the real deal. He's fully God. He's fully human. He's fully compassionate. And he knows every single thing that everyone needs. And the first thing he knows that she needs after going through death, the same death he's going to conquer very shortly after this, he knows that after making that, trans that, 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 that transformation from death back into life, that she's going to need physical sustenance. He could have said a lot of things. Give her something to drink. I'm sure she's thirsty too. Uh, give her a hug. Tell her where she is. Tell her what happened. He could have said a lot of things, but he knows exactly what she needs. And there you go. Story Number one, wrapped up, store, miracle number two, completed. End of story, as a passage, sandwich is made. But now Mark, I believe, wants you to eat this sandwich. And there's no clock in here. Is there a clock? I normally have an internal clock. On Sunday mornings, it, when about 25 minutes says, you need to wrap it up. But here I have, well, my time's a little shorter now, which is a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> but what time is it? 10 minutes. I can do this in 10 minutes. All right. It's not impossible. If we look at this sandwich that Mark makes for us, I think there are several things that emerge. First of all, there are a lot of, there are a lot of differences, contrasts between these two stories. Think about Jairus. Jairus is, uh, particularly think about the characters of the story, Jairus is a somebody in society. This woman is a nobody. We don't even know her name. Jairus is popular and prestigious and powerful. This unnamed woman is seemingly insignificant, powerless, and secluded. Jairus is rich. He's wealthy. He's a man of means. He probably has a kingdom of his own. He's a leader in the synagogue. And unfortunately, you had to have money to do that. This woman is completely broke. She spent all her money on trying to find healing. Jairus' faith is loud, and it's dramatic, and it's blatant. This woman's faith is quiet and discreet. And covert. But yet there are so many more similarities between the stories and particularly between the characters. The first similarity between the stories is so interesting. I'm a numbers person, not as a mathematician, but I'm a numbers person in scripture, and I think numbers matter. And the first similarity is Jesus healed this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years, and he raised the girl from the dead who was how old? 12 years old. Which means, duh, right? The, the, the girl was born the same year that this woman first experienced her bleeding disease, and yet on the same day, they both experienced the miraculous life that Christ offers. Amazing similarity. But either of the characters in the story, Jairus and the unnamed woman, either of them could have easily thrown in a towel, like so many people do. Either of them could have thought, you know, the crowd's just too big. I don't have a fast pass. I'm not going to get to Jesus. I'm just going to give up. Besides, he'll come back through tomorrow. I hear he's always on the move. He's going all over town, all over Judea and Samaria. He'll, he'll come back. Either of them could have just decided it was much, much easier to wallow in their self-pity than exercise their faith. Either one of them could have come up with a million and one excuses why it didn't make sense to see Jesus publicly. It didn't make sense for the woman to go out because she's already ostracized. It wouldn't make sense for Jairus to go out because then he'd be ridiculed by his Pharisee friends. Either one of them could decide just that it wasn't worth the trip. But neither one of them wanted to miss the opportunity of a lifetime. Neither one of them wanted to miss a chance when they heard that the Savior, the God who saves, was coming through. So, so 
both of them decided in their need that they had one option, which is to throw aside anything they had, pride, prestige, honor, dignity, and go to Jesus. Both of them found themselves at Jesus' feet. One fell at Jesus' feet before a miracle. The other one fell at Jesus' feet after a miracle. Both of them realized that there's only one solution to their problem, and his name is Jesus. And so both of them took steps of faith towards Jesus and because both of them took steps of faith towards Jesus both of them experienced a miracle and if we look at both their stories we can come with the amazing truth to walk away with this unbelievable truth is that Jesus today is the same Jesus who moves mightily throughout this earth and he still is in reach today he's in your reach he's in my reach he's easily accessible you don't have to go far at all to find him He's accessible to everyone, too, the rich and the poor, the strong and the weak. You could have bo boisterous, loud, dramatic faith, or your faith could be timid, quiet, or tame. You don't have to have credentials to get to Jesus. You don't have to get through uh, different levels to get to Jesus. It's not a game where you have to conquer level one to get to level two. You don't have to have special rules or regulations to get to Jesus. You don't have to check in with a pastor or phone a friend or be an ashram evangelist to get to Jesus, all you have to do is simply go to the one who's already standing ready and willing to, to welcome us. Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew eleven twenty three, I be, believe it is, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. What an amazing invitation that he offers everyone. You don't have to go far to meet him. Come to me, all who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. What an amazing invitation, but it's just an invitation. We have to do our thing. We, like Jairus and like this unnamed woman, we have to take steps of faith and go to Jesus, the one who's welcoming us at any time, anywhere, on any day. We have to do our part. I don't think he wants an RSVP. I don't think he wants a, we'll see you later. Sorry, I called, take a note and take a message. He's open. He's ready and willing to receive us. So if you're tired or weary, Jesus says, come to me. If you're anxious or discouraged, Jesus says, come to me. If you're dealing with uh, some sort of physical ailment or disease, Jesus says, come to me. If there are economic problems in your life or marital problems or problems with your kids, Jesus says, come to me. He stands ready and willing and actually lovingly longing to meet us. It doesn't have to be at an ashram retreat. It can be anywhere. It can be in the backyard at your house or at work. He says, come to me. The invitation is always open. And he's always ready. And when we do come to him, we will experience a pop, and it will happen immediately. One more story, and I'll close. Because when we do come to Jesus, there's so much that we can receive it's endless back to the farm real quick back to my grandfather's farm back to the gas pump when my dad was driving he was driving a 41 buick three on the wheel four on the floor before my time but that's what it was this particular day he also was in a hurry he was in a rush and so even though he had a gas pump on the farm this particular day, he was high on life and low on gas, but he thought he could make it to his destination, so he went. He drove. He had to get somewhere. Obviously, you know what's happening, what's going to happen. He ran out of gas. He ran out of gas about two miles from the house, and this is um, for you millennials out there. <laughs> I'm barely not a millennial, but um, they didn't have cell phones, right? So... If you didn't have, probably it was probably a lot cheaper than a quarter. If you didn't have some sort of currency or you didn't know somebody who had a phone, then you're out of luck. You got to go find a way back home or you got to call someone who cares and find a phone. And so my dad walked to his friend's house because he wasn't quite prepared to walk home yet. He called my grandfather. He said, Grand he said Dad, I ran out of gas. Grandpa didn't say anything, he just hung up the phone. And all of a sudden, about 10 minutes later, Grandpa's truck pulled up to this 41 Buick. Grandpa got out of the truck, went to the back of the truck, pulled up a gas tank, came over to the car, put gas in the tank, looked at my dad, put it in some more, looked at my dad, put it in, went back to the truck, put it in the truck, and then drove away. My dad's like, oh, snap, something's going to happen. But he thought it best not to 
go where he was going to go, but to come, come home. So he got home. They had family dinner. My grandfather never said anything to him. Dinner was over. May I be excused? May I be excused? May I be excused? He had four siblings. They're all excused. Grandma got up as well. Now it's just my dad and his dad sitting there. And then Grandpa finally breaks his silence. He says, you know what? You would think that a guy who gets his gas for free would never run out of gas. And it's all he said. We have a Savior who does the miraculous, the impossible, who has invited us to come to him when we're weary and carrying heavy burdens, who offers us not just some relief or some grace or some hope or some love here and there in portions, but actually offers those things without end. You would think, I can almost hear my grandpa saying this to me on days when I, when I doubt that I have enough strength from God to make it through the day. I can hear grandpa saying, you know what, Jason, you would think that a guy who gets his grace for free would realize that he never, ever has to run out of grace. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this time we have just to wrestle through some of the story here that we have from Mark. I thank you for the witness that he has. I thank you for showing us a glimpse of your son and his amazing power once again i ask that you just break through time and space and that you supernaturally instill within us the same divine life that you instill within these people let us have a renewed energy a renewed excitement about loving you and serving you and help us also to realize that no matter what comes our way we we have a savior who is a miracle worker who offers us a personal relationship with him and at the same time extends unending, limitless, limitless love and grace and hope and whatever else we need. And God, we know at the end of the day that you are concerned about each and every one of us and you know exactly what we need when we need it. And so for those of us who are hungry, who are thirsty, who are longing for more of you, let us be reminded of what you told family and the disciples after you raised a little girl to give her something to eat. Give us exactly what we need this day. We pray all this in the name of Jesus and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, brother. Uh, Ray, would you take a glance at the prayer chart and just see if we have any holes in it before? Do what? <laughs>